Uh, you know, in the peanut gallery back there is awfully noisy today. <laughs> the, so today we're talking about uh, week two of control groups in security. I know it sounds about as much fun as drinking motor oil, but, you know, risk assessments are important. Control groups are important because they justify things to your clients. And if you've ever been locked in a room and had to do like compliance audits, you know that it is not entertaining. <laughs> it is dry, but a lot of work comes out of compliance meetings. A lot of work gets identified that you may have missed. Like everybody thinks it's a great idea to do this stuff, but it's like, ah, we'll get to that someday. Well, that's the whole purpose of compliance today. That someday is today. You have to address it today before you can move on. And so the nerds that be have broken things into control groups. And in 800-53 uh, NIST, we have 20 of them, as I mentioned last week. And I've broken down to like my six favorites, essentially, that are that are kind of focused on with, uh, with MSPs, what I focus on in my career. Only and, you would have favorites in this. I know, like my, my pet... <laughs> Uh, you know, incident response is great. And I thought about putting that in, but uh, when it comes to incident response, that is more on the business and it's more of a business functionality. Like, hey, when you see a uh, virus uh, screen pop up on your computer, what do you do? Um, if somebody uh, comes in and steals a computer and runs out the door, what do you do? So incident response, like what's the checklist? Uh, with MSPs, we're not as concerned about those because we're not inside the customer every day. So one of the things that we are responsible for, and that is a big deal that pushes a lot of money towards us, is what we're talking about this week. So last week was access control and configuration management, the bread and butter of every MSP out there. You control who has access to what, and you set it up the way you want. And then if you've ever taken over for an, another MSP, you had to undo all of their access controls, put your access controls in, and undo all of their configuration management and put yours in. So like reviewing last week, large customers, they love things like Seam solutions, uh, log management solutions, things that are gonna alert them when bad things are happening. That's your access control. Who's logging into places they shouldn't be? Small customers just need basic event alerting. And then for configuration management, your annual standardization project, all networks. Uh, in the corporate world, we would do this like basically once a year, go through all of our network gear and stuff, never make sure everybody's using the same version and using the same um, rules. So this week, the super exciting the not to be uh, overlooked audit and accountability AU and identification and authentication. These two are the ones that IT people complain about the most. Because who out there likes to audit systems? Skip, maybe? No, not, not, not in the least bit. Not <laughs> in the least bit. Who likes to go out and tell their customers they're being idiots outside of Bob? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what you, that's what you get for being in the peanut gallery today, Bob. Uh, so the uh, the thing is, this is always gets overlooked, but we, these belong in what we call the service pillar of the HIT framework. Because these are things we're doing for our clients. Configuration management, access control, those are all architecture. You're just, you're just controlling objects in the network. But with service, you're saying, hey, how can we help? So audit and accountability, uh, what has been happening for the past five years, and it's partially MSP's fault, is audit and accountability has been severely overlooked. You guys yep. are really great at your own password policies, but how often are we auditing the third parties of our clients? How many hacks have happened over the past, let's just say the last 24 months that were from vendor access? Now, if you're in security, you know for a fact that the last 10 years have been very rough on several large companies because of third parties having really lax security measures. 
Yep. And well, the one that pops to mind on that without going all the stories, I mean, you know, uh, one of the biggest, you know, credit card hacks was a few years back with Target. And if you remember that one, that one came in from an HVAC guy. Uh, So, you know, when we, when that's the conversation, maybe that's the avenue that we sit down with our clients is, is we pick something that they all identify with. And I know that one's getting a little bit old, but I, I just remember so many people that I was in contact with griping and complaining because they were having to swap out all their online accounts. They had to get a new credit card number because they had shopped at Target, all right? Something very commonplace. And, you know, so that putting that into terms they can understand, hey, why, why are we doing this? Well, this is one of the many things, and you don't have to find an example for everything, but if you can show them the perspective that you're coming from, you know, in this case, it was an HVAC guy that got in, and he's why you have to swap out your credit card on your Netflix account. Um, so, you know, j- just being able to come to your clients with the right perspective, the right context, and and here's here's a little silver lining on this: uh, we can push some of the heavy lifting here off to our clients on these things. Because some of these are judgment calls. Who needs access, all right? It's not necessarily us up to to figure that out. So we have to sit down with our clients. We have to ask them the question and let them make the decisions. And now that's an interesting role for us because we're the technical guys. We like having the technical answers. We don't like it when people uh, disagree with our technical answers, right? Because we're 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 the experts, and so. But this is an interesting little bit of role for us to sit down with the client and say, "Who needs access?" You may disagree with them a little bit. You may want to have a conversation slightly, but I, I encourage you to not try and lead them. Not try and say, "Hey, this guy doesn't really need this access." Put put the decision making on them. It is a responsibility. Make sure they're informed. All right, without teaching them how to be security experts, just just make sure they understand and walk through them. This is going to be uh, beneficial in a couple of ways. And one, it it relieves a lot of the responsibility and the pressure from you to make these decisions that, to be honest, you aren't quite qualified to make. Okay, it's not your organization; it's your client's organization. And then separately, by walking with your clients through this process you strongly, strongly develop the relationship with those clients. And they're going to come to lean on you more as time goes on for hopefully things that are a little less boring than some of these. Right? But, um, you know, don't, don't think of this. This is another to do that you got to go create a ticket for and assign to an engineer and just burn some hours on this. This is a multifaceted approach and it has cost, but it has benefits in many areas as well. And so like audit and accountability sounds like boring, but there are a number of projects that come out of this and things that you can charge your clients for. Uh, So if you look in the chat, Mike Giovanni is just talking about how like he held somebody accountable and now they've changed their security practice and the world is a better place. And when you set those accountability standards with your clients, you find that they will uh, change now that they have an accountability standard. And you can charge for these things like, hey, I have a boilerplate uh, um, password policy that we can apply to your organization. And it becomes part of your acceptable use policy every year. 500 bucks, I'll, I'll give it to you guys all um, once a year. It's a one-time charge, or we can include it if you're part of our elite packaging. Those, those little things that you can do. And now whenever a third party comes in, a part of the HR checklist that they have is, what's your password policy? You have to adhere to our uh, 12 characters or our 20 character string limits for external access. And now that gets checked. And then the vendor goes, wait a minute, I can't do 20 characters. I have, I, I have lim- I, I can't do that. And like, well, you need to call our IT guy and you guys need to figure it out. Well, now that's a service you offer, third-party vendor management. That is something you're doing for them and you charge for it. Or you say, hey, if you're part of our elite packaging, I do that for you. 
if you're part of our uh, a la carte plan, it's $500 a year and or whatever you decide you want to charge for it, depending on the size of the client. Audit accountability is a really easy way to earn extra money. And it really helps your clients feel very secure because at least somebody is holding the vendors accountable and if somebody is holding the internal personnel accountable. Yes, you can turn on those features in Active Directory, but there are more tools out there than just Active Directory, as we all know. So that just becomes something you can add. But when you do a NIST audit, when you're in that risk pillar and you're doing that NIST overview and it brings up those questions about our audit and accountability, now you can say, we recommend you implement a password policy in your organization. We have a boilerplate, a set of boilerplates available for elite members or for a one-time price of 1500 bucks for the full suite. Well, remember, and there, there can be two parts to this. I mean, having a policy that manages passwords or sets guidelines is all fine and well, but that's just pieces of paper floating around somewhere until you have a tool that can actually enforce that. So a policy is services, all right, and a tool is infrastructure. So um, think through that process. If you have a policy that says they need to do something, but you don't have anything to actually do that function with, then you need to revisit the architecture. And, and so we have multiple ways that we can generate activity, generate projects, or if nothing else, create the alignment that we need within the organizations. So this can be a multi, again, a multi-step process. Uh, you go through the example and say, hey, we want all of our vendors. You give the whole target, you know, example and they go, oh, that's a great idea. Yes, we need to lock that down. And then you can say, but to do that, you guys are going to have to implement this. And you can point back to the architecture assessment where you define that. And it's cool because at the end of your period, you're going to be moving the needle on a couple of sets of numbers. So it's nice because it shows a lot of progress, but it also shows that, that things really are connected, that this is not just one solution that we're dropping out of a box. Basically, you're uncovering things that you can now charge for for projects. And it might have been things that you already know are great ideas. However, because you never had a deliberate conversation for them, it's money left on the table. Mm -hmm. Client knows that they need to audit these things. You know they need to audit these things, but no one's done it because it just never came up in conversation. Now with a uh, security audit, you have the excuse to bring it up in conversation. And then you can say, hey, let me go through all the uh, egress points to your environment and make sure that we have set appropriate uh, restrictions on them. That becomes part of your access control audit. And then you say, oh my gosh, we have uh, uncovered 15 people using password for password. And we think it doesn't happen today, but we all know better. Come on, guys. Uh, the, per the person using this like really bad passwords. I had to chastise my daughter the other day. Much to my chagrin, she had used her birthday for her pin code on her phone. Right? <laughs> yep. No, you will change that. I audited her phone. I said, no, you're going to change that. Bad, bad daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and so she did, but she just didn't know. She That was a clever way to, uh, to track her password. So the... The next thing is identification and authentication. So this kind of goes hand in hand with what we're just talking about is, are you using any way to identify who's on the network? So this is your multi-factor. This is where you sell multi-factor to your clients. You know that nice duo partnership you have? This is your excuse to use that or your RSA two factor that you're using or Whatever you guys are using out there, what is popular today? It was, it was Duo back when I was a security officer. Um, and you called your phone, you tapped a tapped agree, and you were in. Uh, Google Authenticator, whatever it is that you're using for multi-factor, this is the control IA that's going to help you push that on your clients. Like, look, if you do this, it's going to solve your access control problems and your accountability problems because now we know for a fact who is logging into your systems. And you may think, oh, we're just a dog kennel. No one wants to be in here. I can tell you as a security advisor that one of the biggest hacks we had involved a bunch of just security cameras across the world that just started 
doing interesting things because they'd all been hacked. So many had been hacked that it just caused a flood of traffic to some interesting places. And you guys did not follow that hack about four years ago. It was a very cool one. We all in the in the corporate world had to agree to go through and upgrade all of our of all of our uh, security cameras to stop this particular problem. So, no matter how small your client is, you still need to have some kind of identification authentication mechanism in place so that you're not responsible for ser serving up kitty porn or ser serving up DDoS attacks against major sites that are out there. And so what we wanna do is we want to use the IA control group as MSPs to identify and figure out what's going, who's on the network and what they're doing. And this sets forth, again, your multi-factor, your boilerplate policies, uh, your the audit and accountability, that is a service that you offer, say for X dollars, I will go through and audit every one of your devices to make sure that there are no third party um, egress points or that the third party egress points are controlled. And you can buy tools to, to help you with this. We've all played around with password tools that audit your Active Directory. We've all played around with ones that look on your VPNs, make sure that the passwords are appropriately set. There's different ones that you can do and you can charge for those. Now you have a reason. So for those of you who are not busy enough out there, if <laughs> you run through a NIST audit, you will no longer be bored. There you go. You run a NIST audit on every one of your clients. And these are just four. So last week we talked about access control, configuration management. This week was audit and accountability and identification and authentication because they're kind of tied together. You will have work to do. Your clients yeah. will have justification for it. And now it's just a matter of when are you going to do it? And that's the beauty of the, the NIST audit, the risk pillar. Um, next week, we're going to go through contingency planning and awareness and training. And I found that amongst most of the corporate clients I have, as well as small businesses, this is extremely overlooked, but super easy to do. And so next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you two things that you should be able to charge uh, a good $5,000 for, for even smaller clients that I think that will help you show value as well as it's something really fun to do with contingency planning. Contingi uh, so you, you got me there. I, I have been through some contingency planning and surprisingly enough, those are actually pretty fun. Uh, they're kind of hard to get people involved in, but once you get it going, uh, it gets pretty interesting. So yeah, uh, come back next week for that one. That one is a very, lot, there's a very lot more interesting. There's a very specific exercise that I will, I will help you guys learn about that you've probably heard of. Um, and I'll just say it, it's tabletop exercises. I have run these, they're fun, they're interesting. Um, and uh, you can charge quite a bit of money for them because they take time to build together. But you as an MSP can have them pre-built so when you walk in, you're just running the exercise. And then the client knows that next time a pandemic hits or next time a tornado, blizzard, tsunami, whatever's common natural disasters in your area, they're ready. And they know that a third party came in and ran it for them. So it's almost like a workshop. So we'll talk about that next week. We'll talk about awareness and training. Uh, it's more than just phishing and acceptable use policies. So uh, I was trying to make it quick today because I know that uh, for a lot of you, the security stuff, security planning and NIST audits are kind of boring. So next week, tune in for the last week of our audit and control family overview. But out of each one of these weeks, you should be able to develop new projects to deliver to your clients that will generate more revenue. There you go. All right. We'll see everybody next week. See ya.